Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Lichen. I'm the president of the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, and I'm delighted to introduce our program today featuring Robbie Kaplan and her conversation with our U.S. Attorney Steve Dettelback. Yesterday, May 1st, was Law Day. We celebrate Law Day every year to reflect on the role of law in the foundation of our country and to recognize its importance in our society. And what better place to have this conversation than the Citadel of Free Speech, the City Club of Cleveland? And what better topic to illustrate the importance of law in our society than the fight for equal rights for the LGBT community? Now, Robbie and Steve are going to get into this in some detail today, and I just wanted to give a little bit of context to today's conversation. It's been almost a year since the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark decision striking down the Defense of Marriage Act and bringing Robbie Kaplan to national attention. Still, here in Ohio, there is a 2004 constitutional amendment which bans same-sex marriage. A lawsuit filed this week on behalf of six Ohio couples claims that that amendment violates the Equal Protection and Due Process Clauses of the U.S. Constitution. On this law day, the law is far from settled. The issue of marriage aside, it is currently legal in Ohio to be fired from your job, denied an apartment, refused service at a movie theater, restaurant, or hotel because of your sexual orientation or gender identity. Ohio's hate crimes law does not specifically address crimes motivated by the victim's sexual orientation or gender identity. And Ohio is just one of many states that are facing these issues. Robbie Kaplan, uh, who hails from Cleveland, from Shaker Heights, has become a hero to many in the fight for LGBT equality. Her representation of Edie Windsor resulted in last June's Supreme Court decision. And recently, representing Equality Ohio, Robbie filed a motion in the U.S. Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals to intervene on a case to allow couples married in a state which recognizes same-sex marriage to be put on the death certificates of their spouse in states that do not recognize those marriages. Now, this may seem like a minor point to many, but this right has significant implications when it comes to inheritance, insurance, and other rights that deeply affect domestic life. She's a native of Cleveland. She graduated from Harvard College, Columbia Law School, and before that, attended Hawken with many of the people in this room, including our own Steve Zettelbach. So let me turn it over to Steve to introduce Robbie. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you to the bar uh, and the City Club for, again, hosting a wonderful Law Day program. Uh, Roberta Kaplan, I'll start by calling you Roberta. Please just start that way. Uh, was uh, a, a native of Shaker Heights, Ohio, uh, where she grew up, and as John said, attended Harvard uh, College and Columbia Law School. After that, she clerked uh, both in federal court and for the highest court in the state of New York for uh, Chief Judge Judith Kaye a renowned jurist, and then went to practice at Paul Reif, Riskin, Wharton, Garrison, and Garrison, um, uh, where she now is a partner, and a big-time New York litigator. Uh, she has a commercial practice, which would be the envy of any litigator in any city in the world, representing such clients as Fitch and J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, she also has another practice. Uh, she also has one of the most enviable and important civil rights practices uh, in the world right now. In 2006, that caused uh, Robbie to serve as counsel for 12 same-sex couples in the state of New York who were seeking to have the right to marry under state law, a case that she was unsuccessful uh, before in the, clerk that, the court that actually she had clerked before. Uh, and I then, descent from Judge K, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, of course, as John said, uh, in the last two years, uh, she represented Edie Windsor, and in that case, uh, represented Ms. Windsor in the case that caused the Supreme Court uh, to strike down the Defense <coughs> of Marriage Act, an act that the Supreme Court, and I'm proud to say, the Justice Department before that had found was simply indefensible in our constitutional system. But to me, long before that, Robbie Kaplan was l quite literally the girl next door. Uh, I grew up uh, uh, a block or so away from uh, Robbie. We went to Hawkins together. We graduated high school together. Uh, hundreds of times at <laughs> 7 o'clock in the morning, 
We rode in the cramped back seat of a Honda Civic hatchback. And I was still, I was a big guy uh, to school together. Uh, uh, her brother, Peter, who is here, uh, and my little brother were best friends. They had, I think we can agree, maybe a more interesting high school Definitely. experience than we did. More uh, fun, probably, too. Uh, her parents, Rich and Bess, lived down the street also from me, and her father played golf with my father every Sunday for many, many years. Uh, so uh, it's a point of personal pride for me and for our community uh, to welcome back not only uh, as a great litigator, but a great leader to our city, Robbie Kaplan. Thank you. Uh, Chief Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg just uh, today was quoted in the Wall Street Journal uh, talking about the Windsor case, and something she said struck me. She said that uh, Ms. Windsor, Edie Windsor, was, quote, such a well-chosen plaintiff. Now, can you tell us a little bit about, did, did you choose her or did she choose you? No, no, the lucky thing here is that she chose me. I didn't chose Edie. Uh, the story, um, I'll try a brief version of the story, but Edie Windsor uh, is now 84. Um, she grew up uh, in Philadelphia uh, during the Depression. Her father lost his family uh, business in their home during the Depression. And she, um, during college, she went to Temple University, she realized that she was a lesbian, but because of the time then, uh, as she put it, she couldn't imagine being a queer. Um, and she married a guy by the name of Saul Windsor, that's how she gets the name, um, uh, who was her brother's best friend and who had fought with her, fa her brother in World War II. Um, the marriage, needless to say, didn't last very long. After only a few months, um, Edie said to Saul, you deserve to be loved the way you deserve to be loved, and I need something else. Uh, and so she effectively came out to him back then, and she moved to New York, uh, like so many other people, including myself, in order to be gay, her words. Um, flash forward, I can tell, I can go on and on about Edie's life, and I'm sure I will today, but flash forward many years, uh, she met a woman by the name of Thea Spire. Uh, they were together for 44 years. Um, they were married uh, in Canada. It's actually my fault. I lost the New York case, so they had to go to Canada. <laughs> I think I paid her back for it, though. <laughs> um, and um, uh, upon Thea's death, um, even though she realized she was going to have this problem, she didn't fully appreciate the extent of it, uh, she had to pay an enormous estate tax uh, because of this statute known as the, the so-called Defense of Marriage Act. I don't think it was defending any marriages. Um, and the reason she had to pay that state tax is under this law, uh, the marriages of gay people for fe purpose of federal law were not marriages, although the marriages of straight people were. So if you're a straight couple and you were married, obviously you don't have to pay an estate tax when your spouse dies if you inherit their property. But if you were a member of a gay married couple, you did because it wasn't a marriage. Your spouse wasn't a spouse, and Thea was like a stranger to her. Um, and the bill was huge, um, and she wasn't happy about it. One of the many things that makes her an ideal client, as, as, as Justice Ginsburg said, is she said she was indignant uh, at having to pay this bill. You don't get a lot of clients who use words like indignant on their own, so it's perfect. Um, and she went around Sometimes looking when you send them your bill, they... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then I get a lot of indignance. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you haven't even seen one of my bills, Steve, so that's true. Um, she went around looking for a lawyer. And um, uh, fortunately for me, but unlucky for them, um, she called some of the gay rights groups and they turned her down. Um, and then she, but she was still indignant and she was looking around and we have some mutual friends and she called me. Um, and I actually knew, I didn't know Edie, but I did know Thea because if you were a lesbian in New York, anyone who you knew was seeing a lesbian psychologist saw Thea Spire, so I knew immediately who she was. Um, and I walked over to her apartment, she lives four blocks away, took one look at her, um, heard her talk, heard her story, and it took about three seconds for me to decide to take on the case. But Robbie, I understand from reading that not everybody in the, uh, in the community, the advocacy community, the legal community, agreed with Justice Ginsburg and yourself that this would be the right case. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Well, first of all, lawyers never agree on anything, so there's nothing new about that. That's not that. true. <laughs> uh, yes, it is. Okay. Uh, so there's nothing new about that. Um, uh, I wasn't a party to these conversations, and I, so I didn't hear what they said to Edie, but I understand she was told that she, it wasn't the appropriate case to be brought. Uh, my sense of it uh, is there were really two factors that went into that. One, 
uh, people were concerned about an, uh, an estate tax case and a tax case in general. Um, Edie's tax bill was high. She had to pay $363,000 to the federal government, um, and another $275,000 to New York, and there was a concern that she would be perceived as too rich. Um, as you guys heard, I represent companies like J.P. Morgan and Citigroup, so for me, that didn't sound so rich, mm -hmm. um, number one. And number two, most of her estate tax bill was due to the fact that she had two apartments in New York City that they bought in the 70s. And as anyone who knows New York City real estate knows, they'd appreciated hugely over the years. And that was really the reason for the big estate tax bill. So my view of that was that wasn't an issue. Um, another problem was people were concerned about the tax element, but I, my sense of it is, is that every American knows in their gut what it means to have to pay a tax bill, particularly a tax bill that's a bill on, a, a tax on being gay. Uh, so that Americans would understand that. And even the Republicans, who weren't exactly on our side at the beginning of this case, they don't like the estate tax either. So <laughs> I thought it was the perfect case. And on top of that, of course, you have this incredibly beautiful, incredibly articulate woman who had really had a marriage. I mean, you know, you're together with someone for 44 years. Thea was completely paralyzed by the time they died. Who wouldn't want to have a marriage like Edie and Thea had? So I thought the American people would understand that too. Uh, I've read that when you were uh, working on the case that you had a, a mantra, actually, you had a sticker that was on your desk area on your computer and it said, it's all about Edie. Uh, tell, me, tell us about that. Why did you have that? Sure. Thing? It actually said, I borrowed from the Clinton campaign, it said, it all, it's all about Edie's stupid, to remind <laughs> myself. Um, and, and, you know, that very much animated uh, how, we, how we litigated this case for a couple reasons. First of all, that's the kind of lawyer I am. I mean, I'm used to representing clients. Um, the case is always about my clients. The case should always be, in my view, about the clients and not about the lawyers. Um, so that's just the way I do things. On top of that, um, again, I thought this story about Edie and her marriage and her life would be so important not only for the American people to hear, but for the justices to hear. For, for example, many of the justices of the Supreme Court are essentially Edie's contemporaries. They're a little bit younger than she is, but not a lot. Um, Justice Kennedy, in a case like this, it's no surprise to you, is the guy that matters. His vote's the vote that matters. Um, and he uh, is around Edie's age and would have shared, or at least be aware of some of the things that she'd experienced. Uh, it was reported in Time Magazine uh, that Justice Kennedy, who used to teach at law school in Sacramento, had a very good friend who was the dean of that law school who was a closeted gay man. Um, and they were close. Um, someone has speculated they don't think they ever discussed the fact that his friend was gay, but that Kennedy certainly knew about it. And I thought some of the facts of Edie's life uh, would really be uh, powerful in moving to Justice Kennedy. For example, she was in the closet basically until 2007. Uh, she worked for many, many decades at IBM. She rose to the highest level, uh, technical level that you can rise to at IBM, and she never told anyone that she was gay. Um, and I thought that Justice Kennedy would really be able to understand that. And, I've never spoken to Justice Kennedy about it, but based on his opinion, I think he did. Uh, you know, different people who are lawyers and different people in any profession work in different ways, sometimes collaborative, sometimes you just have to sort of wall yourself off. I understand that while you were writing the brief in this case, uh, you sort of took that to the extreme. Yeah. Uh, tell, us, tell us about the process of doing that. So once uh, the case got to the Supreme Court, things got pretty intense. And I'm not exactly known for my zen-like personality anyway. So <laughs> it, was, it was super intense at that point. Um, the brief, uh, uh, I and the whole team really cared very much about the brief. I mean, these, the arguments at the Supreme Court are very important. But really what matters, and the justices have all said this, is what's in the brief. So we were very focused on trying to persuade uh, the justices to rule our way, and this was the case to do it. Um, uh, there are a couple sections of the brief that I think I rewrote literally uh, hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, I walled myself off. I have a, a small room in our apartment in New York City, a small little office, and I work from there because there wouldn't be any distractions. Um, I don't think I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I don't think I took off my sweatpants uh, for 16 days. Um, uh, by the time it was over and the brief was filed, I felt like a hermit. Like I went to a party that night. I didn't even know how to talk to people anymore. Um, but, you know, that's was, how, that's was how important it was to me and to the team. And it was truly collaborative. Um, uh, one of the things that I did, and I know uh, Steve knows her as well, um, is when we realized this case was getting to the Supreme Court, I, I wanted a local counsel. 
uh, for the Supreme Court to help me because this was my first ever argument before the United States Supreme so Court. So you picked a good one for your yeah, first I, one. Yeah, I did okay. <laughs> and uh, so I called a professor at Stanford uh, named Pam Carlin, who's one of the greatest constitutional scholars of our time, to help. Um, and she was actually going to go to Italy. She was supposed to take a sabbatical in Italy that spring. Uh, and she immediately called me. She didn't know me from a hole in the wall. She immediately agreed and canceled her sabbatical uh, to do this case. Uh, and so, you know, between Pam and the ACLU team and the Paul Weiss team, uh, we were all working very hard. Uh, sometimes, I'm sure that, that when the case became sort of renowned, that many people offered advice to you. Uh, and my guess is, is that some of it was, was really on point, and maybe some of it you chose to, to, to not take. Uh, share with us the process of having a case that goes from being your case with your client to being a case that the whole world is watching you litigate and, and knows how to do better than you probably. Yeah, well, at least thought they did. Um, it, look, it, it's, it's, there, uh, it's just a little bit of pressure on me at this point. I mean, it was, it was intense. Uh, when you prepare, after we got the brief in, when you prepare for Supreme Court argument, you do this thing called moots. Uh, which is essentially you go in front of a bunch of lawyers. Uh, for the most part, we did it with um, Supreme Court advocates and law professors. Uh, we did seven or so of them formally. So we went, did one at Stanford, at NYU, at Georgetown. I did one with Ted Olson. Um, I did one with the SG's office. We, you do a bunch of these. Uh, and basically the process is, is you do, in the Supreme Court you only have 15 minutes. Uh, but at the moot court, they, people question me for about 45 minutes at a time. And then after the 45 minutes, they spend an hour critiquing everything you say. So it's, you know, I can't imagine maybe root canal <laughs> is worse, but I can't think of much that would be worse than that. Um, and we did those, and we listened to what everyone had to say. Um, and, you know, we would, we would take the advice that we liked, as anyone does, and reject the advice uh, that we didn't like. There was some advice that's been written about lately, so I can talk about it, where we were told... Uh, to de-gay the case, that the way we would win this case was to de-gay it. Um, I think our response to that was we didn't know how that was possible. Um, it seemed to us that that was the case, that's what the case was about. Um, Edie Windsor certainly didn't like that advice, and I don't blame her. Um, and, and we really felt uh, that this case was really about the fact that the court couldn't possibly explain, and five justices of the court, thank God, wouldn't be able to explain any difference between a gay married couple. I mean, our, Edie was married between a gay married couple on the one hand and a straight married couple on the other hand that could possibly justify s the sweeping discrimination that was DOMA. Uh, so we had this joke on the team that we could answer, that I could answer any question the justices asked me by saying that the people affected by DOMA were already married and already gay. And there was nothing the court could do that would change either one of those facts, so they should rule in our favor. But my guess is, is this, that's not all you did have to say for the argument. What was it like? <laughs> Uh, taking the case actually to the court and waiting for the decision? Uh, uh, not the, not, again, not the most relaxing period of my life. So cases like this, this is very common, the Supreme Court puts off to the end. So I argued the case in March, on March 27th, and we got the decision on June 26th. Um, but unlike a lot of other Supreme Courts in other countries, our Supreme Court has a tradition of not telling you when the case is coming down. So all they do is say that on a certain day they're going to be announcing cases, but no one knows what cases those will be. And so every time, there were probably about six days like that, where we all lined up, we all came to a, my apartment, uh, we all had lot, laptops logged onto SCOTUS blog, uh, waiting to hear whether it would be our case, and we had about five or six false starts. Um, Edie was not, I have to say, she was probably more stressed, she was more stressed than I was, and she wasn't a happy camper about this at all. Uh, it's reported in the, in the New Yorker, and it's true that she used a, derogatory term about the Supreme Court uh, one of these days when they didn't hand down the decision. And I said, but it's the Supreme Court, so we're going to keep waiting. Um, uh, and then on the day that we got the decision, we knew we were going to get it because it was the last day of the term. So it was clear <laughs> that they would have to issue it that day. Um, and we were really waiting for three things that were important for us. One, um, Supreme Court followers do this incredible analysis of how many justices have written how many opinions each term and how many are left. And based on that analysis, uh, the two opinions to be announced that day were going to be written by Chief Justice Roberts and by Kennedy. There was the Prop 8 case in our case. Um, we felt, call me crazy, that we'd probably be better off if Kennedy wrote our opinion. <laughs> Um, that meant that they would announce our decision first because under Supreme Court protocol, Justice Kennedy is junior, always junior to the Chief Justice. Um, so we were waiting to hear A, that our case was first, uh, B, 
opinion by Kennedy, and then when we saw a uh, dissent by Justice Scalia, we knew that we'd won. Um, <laughs> and before, we, before anyone said a word there, or read a word in the opinion, there was screaming and crying and just incredible jubilation going on in my apartment that day. Um, you know, you have a practice, whereas we talked about, you have you know, large commercial clients involved in very, very high stakes, important litigation. Then you have individual clients like Edie Wharton. Now, I mean, uh, we're taught, many lawyers are taught in law school and in law firms and in places that we work that, uh, you know, as lawyers, we should be detached. That, you know, we're not supposed to sort of have personal skin in the game, that our job is to bring to the situation an objectivity. Uh, but obviously, that can't be true for you. You know, you're uh, there in your apartment with your wife. Rachel, with your, your son, who's here today, Jacob, who's on his uh, On his iPad, iPad. I believe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to ask what he was doing while the waiting was going. Exactly. Um, uh, but this is something that just can't help but be personal for you, too. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the struggle between being an objective, big stakes litigator and doing a case that must mean so much to you as a person also? Yeah, so, you know, I, I kind of see both sides of this argument. I mean, I really believe, I believe that we are part of a noble profession. Um, and I believe that as lawyers, it's our job to tell the clients the truth, even sometimes when they don't want to hear it. Um, and that's our duty. And any lawyer who disagrees with that, I, I respectfully disagree with them. I think that that's what lawyers do. Um, on the other hand, uh, my wife jokes about this. She says, I have this incredible ability to convince myself that no matter whoever my client is, that they are absolutely right. <laughs> that they've done nothing wrong uh, and that we absolutely should win the case and if the judges don't see it that way there's clearly something wrong with them so <laughs> she says she doesn't know how i psychologically do it every time but i clearly do um, in this case obviously uh, that was an easy thing to do um, among other things you know there's Edie, and we've become incredibly close we have a uh, my mother's here so i wouldn't say it's a mother-daughter relationship but it's it has parts of a mother-daughter relationship in the sense that I'm always telling her that she needs to stop traveling so much and take better care of herself and things like that. And she, she tells me to stop controlling her, to her and not listen and doesn't listen to me. Are you talking about Edie or your mother or both? Both. Both. Um, so, uh, and then on top of that, you know, I was married. I'm married and I'm a lesbian. And so DOMA had terrible implications for me as well. So I couldn't help uh, thinking about that, I think as a lawyer, I felt it was very important to try to put that aside. Um, that's one of the reasons I didn't mention earlier why I said it was so important that this case was all about Edie. Um, I did not want lawyers talking and going on press junkets and going on Meet the Press and talking about this case until we had a decision. I wanted it all to be focused on her, um, and that was a strategy that was very important to us. Um, but there were times when it would seep through. So, for example, in the argument, uh, in my oral argument, the Chief Justice really started kind of going after me on this question of why the world has changed so much for gay people. How is it that today there are 17 states that allow gay couples to marry? When we argued the case, there were nine. When we brought the case, there were only five. Um, and his uh, thesis was that people were just following politicians. They were following President Obama. They were following Bill Clinton, who wrote an op-ed before the case. And it was just people following politicians. And I disagreed with that, as you can imagine. And, and actually, I, think, I don't think Americans really ever follow politicians. But I think on this, it was very much politicians, with all respect to the president, following Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and we debated this point. And, I, and you can hear, if you listen to the transcript, I've heard it now a few times, you can hear in my voice that I was, I think that's where the personal came through. Um, and you can hear in my tone. So it came through there. It certainly came through when we won. Um, uh, after we won, when all bets were off and we could feel a lot freer about what we said, uh, things were very different. And I woke, I felt that all last summer, uh, you know the Chagall paintings where the guy's like floating above the world looking right. down at his life? That's what I felt like. I well, felt like the guy in the Chagall paintings. You, you made a, a comment at one point that I think probably summed up the feelings of a lot of people, which is that you said that you had what you call a full milk marriage. Right. Now, t tell us what you meant by that. So during the argument, uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg not only gave this great interview today, but people should go to this. There's actually a website uh, called Notorious RBG uh, <laughs> that's about Justice Ginsburg. Uh, and she likes the website. I wouldn't say she is. She's very proud of it, and she should be. 
Uh, and there's a reason she's called Notorious RBG, because she's truly incredible. Both of the women justice, all three of the women justice from New York, all three of the women justices are incredible. Um, but during the argument, oh, well, let me back up. So we had spent a lot of time in the case really agonizing about how best to explain to the court that DOMA created a kind of caste system in the United States. It created a kind of second class citizenship where gay couples who were married were treated one way and straight couples who were married were treated another. And that, that, was, that kind of a caste system is just offensive to our constitution. And we debated it a lot of different ways. We ended up the way we ended up. Um, but during the argument, uh, during the argument of my adversary, Paul Clement, uh, Justice Ginsburg was, was talking to him and was questioning him and said, isn't it a fact that what DOMA does is creates a kind of skim milk marriage? Because straight couples who are married get everything. They get all the benefits under federal law. And gay couples who are married don't get any benefits under federal law. If anything, they only get benefits if they live in states that allow those marriages. So isn't that a kind of skim milk marriage? Um, and when she said it, she speaks very softly, and she's short, and I, it was hard to hear her. And I turned to Pam Carlin, and I said, what did she just say? And Pam heard her and told me, and I literally had to hold my arm down. I felt like doing this, <laughs> which, which really wouldn't be good for Supreme Court protocol. I held myself back. Uh, but that so captures uh, the essence of what this is all about. It truly is and was, and still is in places like Ohio, uh, where gay couples can't marry, it truly is a kind of skim milk form of citizenship. And that's what the case was all about. And, and how do you view the case now that it's over and now that you're on to new things as sort of fitting into uh, the broader uh, movement for uh, fighting for LGBT rights and really civil rights in general? Where do you think this fits into the broader story? Sure. Uh, let me start with civil rights in general and then I'll go to LGBT rights. Uh, you know, civil rights in general, I, I do believe in. You know, I think um, Attorney General Holder and the President would agree with me um, that this is a very important case and kind of the uh, path our country is taking, uh, 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 the arc that history does bending toward justice, as Martin Luther King said. Um, one of the most surprising things that happened in the case, and you mentioned this, uh, was when the administration decided not to defend the, the statute. And that was actually, I'll tell you a story because it's a funny story. So we filed our case. Uh, we, we filed it in the Second Circuit, which meant that uh, we knew that the DOJ was going to have to take a position on whether DOMA and whether gay people in general, whether laws that treat gay people differently should get what's called heightened scrutiny under the law. That means should courts look more carefully at a law that treats gay people differently the same way they have to look more carefully uh, at laws that treat African Americans differently or laws that treat women differently. And many circuits had laws, uh, had cases on that. The Second Circuit, it was wide open. And so we filed the case. Edie at the time was 80. Um, about 30 days in, uh, the DOJ had a brief that was going to uh, be due in a bit. And I got a call from the line DOJ attorney. Um, and this woman, who was quite lovely, said to me, we'd like an extension. And I don't normally get to represent plaintiffs, so I was pretty psyched about this. And I said, no. I said, I'm representing Edie Windsor. She's 80 years old. She's been in the hospital with, with heart problems. I want her to be alive. When she gets a no extension, forget about it. Then I got a call from a more senior person at the DOJ saying, Robbie, we'd really like an extension. And I said, no way. Forget about it. Then I got a call from Tony West. Uh, Tony West, for those of you who aren't law geeks like me and Steve, is currently the second in command at the Department of Justice. Uh, and he said, you know, Robbie, you know, what's, what's going on? I hear you won't give us an extension. He said, I am calling you to tell you that we are asking for this extension because the president and the attorney general and I seriously want to consider and discuss what to do in this case. And even then, I said, OK, I'll get back to you. <laughs> I asked By the way, when you work <laughs> at the Department of Justice, that's, it's really, you don't have that option. I, I'm sure. I asked some of my partners, and they said, are you crazy? Of course you're going to give the Attorney General an extension, and I did. Um, but I was cynical even then. I mean, I think we can all be too cynical about things, including myself. And I was cynical even then. And so I said to Tony, I said, look, I said, I understand you and the President are going to be deliberating about this. I said, I just want you to know I'll be praying for you as you deliberate. <laughs> 30 days later, I get an email uh, saying I was on spring vacation with Jacob and Rachel, and I get an email saying the Attorney General and uh, Assistant Attorney General, Tony West, would like to have a phone call. We knew immediately what that meant, because that's not an email you get very much as a private attorney. You may get it a lot, but I don't get an email like that very much. And we knew immediately what it was. We, we got on the call. Uh, Tony explained how the President 
um, had decided that they could not defend DOMA. I have tears running down my face. I really didn't think that would have happened. Um, and at the end of the call, Tony says to me, he said, Robbie, he said, you remember that thing you said at the end of our call about praying for me and the president? I said, yeah. He said, sometimes prayer works. <laughs> um, but the truth is here, it wasn't prayer entirely either. The, the, really quickly, the standard for heightened scrutiny, there are four factors. One is the group, uh, is, someone, uh, is the plaintiff a member of a group that has suffered discrimination? For gay people, I think that's a duh, as my son would say, or he says doy. I think that's a doy. Two, is there anything about being a member of that group that affects your ability to contribute to society? Again, doy. Three, should you have to change being a member? Can you or should you have to change being a member of this group in order not to be discriminated against? And four, is this group so politically powerful that they can get anything they want through the legislature and we don't need to intervene? Those are the four factors. I have said this, and I believe it in the bottom of my heart, that it is not a coincidence that it was three African-American men, the President, Attorney General Obama, and Tony West who made that decision. I truly believe that when they were doing it, it wasn't politics, it wasn't MSNBC versus Fox, it wasn't any of that, that they sat down and as three black guys, they were like, we will not write that brief. And that's what led to the decision. Uh, last question, and then uh, we'll go to the, uh, the, the audience. So this is Law Day, and um, you know, we're talking about what law means and reflecting on it. Uh, so this is a case where, at one side, the, the courts uh, vindicated the best aspirations of what the rule of law means. But as you pointed out, in another way, uh, it was about a law that was democratically enacted which we now know uh, unconstitutionally burdened millions and millions of Americans for many, many years. When you reflect on what the law means, and as a lawyer, uh, whether the law, sometimes bad laws or immoral laws, uh, are, have to be dealt with, how does this play into your worldview, uh, both as a person as a and as a lawyer? Well, I always give young lawyers advice when they're doing research for me in a case that if, if some, a rule, if you're doing some research and you think the cases don't make sense, then you need to go back and do the research because they should make sense. Uh, I, you know, I guess I'm not as cynical as I think I am. Uh, the law should make sense and certainly the Constitution should make sense. Um, and, you know, back when DOMA was passed in 1996, there were opinions from very, very prominent uh, constitutional law professors saying DOMA was completely kosher. No problems with the Constitution of DOMA. Uh, but you can, as a lawyer, as a person, lose sense of who you are and lose sense of what your gut tells you about what is right. Uh, and if your gut tells you about what, what something is right, you've got to keep fighting for it. I lost the first marriage case. Uh, we got hosed uh, by the New York Court of Appeals. Um, but I kept on fighting, and ultimately uh, we won Windsor, and I think Windsor inevitably is going to lead to victories throughout the rest of the country. Today at the City Club, we are learning a ton uh, at the Friday Forum with Robbie Kaplan, partner at Paul Weiss, lead counsel in the Windsor case that overturned the Defense of Marriage Act. We'll return to Robbie in a moment for our traditional City Club question and answer period, and we encourage you in the audience to formulate questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. Uh, we welcome all of you here and those joining us through our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, 104.9 WCLV, and WVIZ PBS IdeaStream, or on one of the many other radio stations across the country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PMC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Next Friday, May 9th, the City Club welcomes Dr. Denise Spellberg, author of Thomas Jefferson's Quran and professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Texas, Austin. For more information on upcoming programs, to make a reservation or to order a CD or DVD of today's program, please refer to the website www.cityclub.org. Today we welcome guests at tables hosted by Baker Hostetler, Cleveland Marshall College of Law, the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, Equality Ohio, friends of Richard and Beth Kaplan, friends of Joe Simperman, Hawkins School alumni, Hawkins School, and the Legal Aid Society. We thank you all for your support. Today is the annual forum on the American justice system made possible by a generous endowment gift from Robert J. Fay, David I. Sindel, Myron Crodinger, Paul W. Walter, and Jesse Glassman in memory of Samuel Glassman. Thank you all for your support. 
We also welcome students to today's forum. Student participation is made possible by a generous gift from the Development Pipeline Company. Joining us today are students from North Royalton High School, Shaw High School, and Westlake High School. Will the students please stand and be recognized? Thank you all for being here. Today's program is also in partnership with the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, and as I say, we couldn't be more delighted, and thank you for your support. And now let's return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We, w we welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are our program director, Carrie Miller, and marketing and outre outreach specialist, Kirsten Pianca. So can we have our first question, please? <coughs> Hello, my name is Shaquille Tyson from Shaw High School. I am a graduating senior this year, and I would like to say thank you for inviting us. My question today is, uh, earlier today, I had the pleasure of, uh, again, uh, talking to Judge Will Dawson, and uh, he said that you should really plan out your goals to set a steady path for your future. And I was wondering, did you plan out your goals to reach where you was at now, or was it spontaneous? Uh, well, l let, me, let me begin by saying this was a pleasure doing this with Steve. Uh, Steve mentioned the carpool rides uh, that we used to take to school in the morning. And, and I don't know if he, he's changed, but back in high school, Steve was not exactly a morning person. Uh, so uh, it, quite frequently, he would fall asleep on my shoulder uh, as we were riding to school in this teeny little uh, Honda. Um, and so this was a lot more fun than waking him up and saying, Steve, sit up, Steve, sit up. Um, uh, when I was riding in, those car, in that car way back then, I'm scared to say how many years ago, um, I obviously had no idea uh, that I would you know, move to New York, that I would become a partner of Paul Weiss, uh, that I would ever argue a case in the United States Supreme Court, or that it would be a case like Windsor. Um, it's impossible for anyone to plan their lives that way. And anyone who tells you otherwise, don't listen to them. On the other hand, uh, uh, the one thing I learned, and it was a lesson that was taught to me by my parents, and it's true, uh, is that you have to take opportunities when they come your way. You, because you can't plan life, you can't plan when opportunities come your way. And uh, when someone like Edie Windsor comes into your life, the right answer, I think, is to do what I did and immediately say, of course, I'll take on your case, and I'll do it for free uh, for pro bono. Um, you have to trust yourself, you have to trust your instincts, um, and like the advice my parents gave me, that's the best advice I can give anyone. What, what was the importance in your career of mentors? Yeah, incredibly important. So I, oh, thanks for bringing that up, Steve. It's incredibly important. So I got very lucky uh, in my career. Um, Steve mentioned I clerked for Judith Kay, who was the chief judge of New York. Um, I have a very good friend who was a partner of Paul Weiss, who's now a judge, Colleen McMahon, in the Southern District. Um, when the Windsor decision was decided by the Second Circuit, the first, pers the first person to call me was Colleen. Uh, and when the Supreme Court decided, I think the first two people I spoke to after my parents uh, were Judge Kay and Colleen McMahon. Um, so those kinds of relationships are incredibly important. I still call them for advice on hard questions all the time, and it's important to find people like that. They're out there. Ms. Kaplan, on many cases that come before the Supreme Court now, it's almost possible to predict in advance a five to four vote. Five conservative justices will vote one way, and four so-called liberal justices vote the other way. As a very prominent attorney who has had a very successful career in Supreme Court uh, arguments, and this being Law Day, how do you feel about that division? Do you feel that the, there's a certain amount of, of, of distrust, perhaps, or, or uh, uh, lack of confidence that the public will have when the, when the uh, results of the case will be sort of so predictable? Yeah. You know, look, in a lot of the less high-profile cases, the less political cases, for lack of a better term, uh, the Supreme Court, there really isn't that division. There often is, you know, it's 8-1 uh, or 7-2. Um, and that's probably the majority of the cases that the court decides. But unfortunately, and, or maybe fortunately, 
Uh, the Supreme Court's job is to decide cases like Windsor, to decide cases about the meaning of the Constitution. And you're absolutely right that they're often 5-4 cases, and it's often Kennedy, uh, Justice Kennedy is the five, either on one side or the other. Um, in our case, we were actually, I don't know, we were smoking something. Uh, we thought we had a chance at getting a six vote. It's based on the dissents. That was totally not in the cards for us. Um, uh, I would obviously like to have a greater uh, majority on my side of these issues, like any litigator. Um, and I think it's, you know, part of that today is, frankly, the political process. I mean, the president can't even get judicial nominees, forget the Supreme Court, he can't get judicial nominees in the district courts and the circuit courts through the system. Um, the Senate has just become so polarized and, the, and Congress has become so polarized that nothing, unfortunately, effective can get done in D.C. And uh, I think the 5-4 voting that, you've see, that you see is kind of a, a, an example of that. It's a bad effect of that kind of polarization. Hello. Sorry. Hi. Uh, hi, Ms. Kaplan. Thank you for accepting our invitation to be here tonight. My question for you is regarding, well, it's a little technical, regarding the issue of same-sex marriage in the light of loving and full faith and credit. The run-up to the Windsor case and the media analysis thereafter um, made very little, if any, mention of the loving precedent regarding miscegenation, comparing and contrasting the two. What is the role of loving with regard to setting precedent for same-sex marriage cases? And secondly, most of the state-by-state -state wins that we've had so far have been predicated on equal protection and the due process clauses. I have not heard any issue brought up regarding full faith and credit. In fact, here in Ohio, we have accepted, recognized marriages, divorces, and adoptions done in other jurisdictions that would not normally be legal in Ohio. And in fact, the Sixth Circuit decision um, involved gay couples that had gone to Baltimore, married on a tarmac, right. and come back. And eventually, uh, the federal courts told the Cincinnati recorder, I believe, to include the spouse, the same-sex spouse's name on the death certificates. So again, the issues of loving and full faith and credit as valid defenses and uh, precedents for same-sex marriage. Sure, so let me take those separately. Um, uh, uh, Loving v. Virginia, as you mentioned, was a case about a, uh, an interracial couple who weren't being permitted to marry. It was illegal for interracial couples to marry uh, in Virginia, and the Supreme Court ultimately held that that was unconstitutional. Um, that was not a precedent we, li we relied on in Windsor, but for a very obvious reason. In Windsor, these couples were already married. Uh, they weren't seeking the fundamental right to marry, which is what uh, loving has led to. They were already married, and the point was, can you treat couples who are already married differently solely because they're gay? Um, in the cases that are being brought today throughout the country, um, the loving line of analysis, which is a due process fundamental rights line of analysis, is, is being relied on quite heavily. Quite heavily. Uh, Ted Olson, who argued Prop 8, relied on it quite heavily. Um, and it, it remains to be seen which way the court will go. They can do either this fundamental rights theory or the equal protection theory. I have to tell you, I've always thought in my gut uh, that, this, that these cases are really about equal protection. Is, doesn't it seem, uh, when you think about it, that not allowing gay people to have the same rights as straight people is about equal protection? But I'm enough of a litigator that I'll take a win any way I can get it. So <laughs> that's okay with me. Um, in terms of uh, full faith and credit, it's very technical, but most states, you gave a good example, most states like Ohio have a policy where they will recognize marriages from out of state, even if they couldn't be performed in Ohio, unless the marriage contravenes the public policy of the state. So uh, it's that issue, whether it contravenes the public policy of the state, that essentially blends in to the same question of whether there's a right to marry for gay couples in Ohio. So the reason you're not seeing it litigated separately is the two issues kind of combine because of the, the similarities and the standards. And they're being, these recognition cases are being litigated essentially as constitutional cases, which I think is right. It's whether that policy, uh, that public policy of Ohio that says there's something so horrible about gay people marrying and wanting to have responsibilities and pay taxes, call me crazy, I'd like to know what that is. But there's something so horrible about that, whether that policy is constitutional or not. This is for Robbie, and if Steve wants to chime in too, that's fine. What is your opinion on whether judges <clears throat> should be elected or appointed? Aye. Um, 
Uh, well, I live in a state, I, I, I live in New York where judges are both elected and appointed. So we have it both ways in New York. Um, we have a, a family debate about this. Uh, my wife, who's a very active uh, person in the Democratic Party, very much believes that the judges should be elected. Um, I, being a, a, a litigator, sometimes I'm on the side of judges being appointed. Um, I think both things are probably healthy and good. I, in the federal system, I certainly very much agree that federal judges should only be appointed. I think that they should have lifetime tenure as they do and be, only be appointed. Um, but I think there's value in both, and I think there's value in, in the people feeling that they have a hand in who becomes a judge and they have a say in it. What I don't like about it is what you saw like in Iowa, where the Iowa Supreme Court said gay couples have the right to marry, and then most of the judges who rendered that decision, decision were all voted out of office. Uh, and that's not the way the system should work. I have very strong opinions on that, but I'm not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Joshua Cody from Shaw High High School, and I want to say thank you for inviting us. Um, my question is, do you feel that Ohio should stop using the slogan, we're a free country because of an example of gay marriage, because that's not technically being free if you can't marry the one that you love? No, I think Ohio should keep the slogan, but allow gay couples to marry. <laughs> Uh, hi, um, thank you for being here. Uh, I would like to ask a question that uh, you must have had a tremendous pressure on you since you were involved in trying to do this decision for so many people throughout the world. And it was mentioned in the very beginning that the, 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 everyone in the world was looking. And I li happen to live ha more than half the year overseas. And I know a lot of people, Americans living overseas, were un actually unable to return to the United States because if you are married, to uh, your spouse is of same sex, the federal government did not allow you to bring your spouse with you back to the United States. And uh, one of the members of the DNC actually has been an exile um, as an American abroad and is now able to return because he can finally apply for citizenship for his spouse. Uh, did you ever hear from any of these people and, and how did th this affect you, having this pressure on you? Um, Let's do the, the more fun question first. Yes, well, Edie and I, between us, probably heard from hundreds of people like that. Um, uh, the most dramatic impact and immediate impact that the Windsor decision had was these couples who were married, who were binational couples, who were uh, gay, all of a sudden could get green cards. And the Obama administration, to its great credit, acted very expeditiously on this. They started issuing green cards almost immediately. Um, and I can't tell you, I, I need someone to count the number of emails and phone calls, but it, it definitely is in the hundreds. Um, and it's incredible. I just spoke yesterday in New York uh, at a Wall Street event, and one of the guys told me his story where he and his couple, he and his husband had been separated for that reason. So it's an incredibly uh, moving and incredibly important impact of the Windsor decision. Um, in terms of the pressure, uh, the pressure was extreme, uh, as I said. Um, uh, this is a funny story. Actually, the day before the Windsor case was argued, the parity, the Prop 8 case was argued. And um, we watched the arguments, and after our team watched the arguments, we all went back to the office and we kind of talked about whether we need to change anything, what we were going to do. Um, and we all decided that we thought it was looking pretty good for us based on the Prop 8 arguments, so there was nothing we need to change. And that was about 4 or 5 in the afternoon, and we kind of had to decide what to do, or I had to decide what to, I, what to do. Should I go back and read cases? Should I do a moot court? What should I do? Um, and I decided to go back to the hotel. Uh, where my family and everyone was staying, and I basically went up to the room uh, with my son, and we ordered milk and cookies, and we watched Johnny Test cartoons uh, <laughs> for the rest of the afternoon. And in a lot of ways, I think that was the best thing I could have done to prepare for the oral argument uh, at that point in time. So that's at least how I dealt with the pressure. Um, when you get to the Supreme Court, it's really crazy. They have a very formal process, and so they give you this little, there's kind of a pep talk that they give you before you argue, and they, they say things like, you know, if you need cough drops, we have them. If you need pencils, and here's the thing that I love, uh, if you need a sewing kit, you can have a sewing kit. Every time they say that to me, I'm like, what would I do with a sewing kit right now? <laughs> like, even if I lose a button, the button's just going to be gone. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, that period just before the argument was incredibly stressful, and I, I, there's a lawyer's lounge. I just kept pacing back and forth uh, until we got in. You've also talked from time to time uh, about the role that faith 
uh, your faith plays in your life and helps. I'm, I'm wondering if that also has been a, uh, an, an aid in your dealing with the kind of pressure that you are under. I'd like to think so. I hope so. Um, uh, it, it is true. I, you know, I was very concerned in this case that, that our side of the movement had ceded the arguments on the other side, religious arguments to one side. Um, and religious arguments should not only be on one side of this issue. Um, there are many religions and many uh, very serious believers of many religions who believe that God uh, requires us to recognize the dignity and humanity in everyone. And after all, that's what this case was about. This case was whether Edie's dignity and humanity as a person should be recognized as equal under the law, regardless of what your church happens to do in terms of performing marriages for gay couples. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about that on the case. We actually had a brief uh, for the first time ever in one of these gay rights cases from very mainstream uh, religious groups. I got the entire conservative Jewish movement on board. Uh, for the first Personally. time in their history, <laughs> yeah, uh, with some friends, <laughs> some lobbying that went on. We had an Orthodox rabbi, we had Episcopal bishops, we had Presbyterian, I mean, we really had a lot of mainstream groups, and they made that argument. And I, it was very important for me for that to be in front of the court. And if you look at Justice Kennedy's opinion, uh, he mentions the word dignity, I think it's 10 times in 26 pages. So what he keeps saying over and over in his opinion is, Gay people have the same dignity as everyone else. So, and I think that's obviously true. I think it's what's led to all the decisions since Windsor, and I think it's, a, it's the secular expression of that religious view, which I share. Hi there. Um, I'm a recent graduate of Hawkins School, and um, I'm curious about, I know we're pretty well represented here today, and I'm curious about how Hawkin and your youth and upbringing and education influenced where you are today. And uh, I know Hawken really helped me come out of my shell in a lot of ways, and I'm curious if it did the same for you. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, I, you know, I was in the closet uh, until law school, so it was a very different world that people lived in. I, it's amazing to me that there's a gay students organization, Hawken. It's amazing to me, I spoke there this morning, that these, the kids, when you speak about these issues, they're all like, what's the big deal? I mean, it's like nothing to them. Like every time I say to them, oh my God, I was in the closet, they look at me like, what, who cares? Um, uh, uh, that's an example of the way the world has just changed so dramatically in ways that were inconceivable to me in Hawken, but inconceivable to me five years ago, quite frankly. Um, but I got an amazing uh, education in Hawken. Um, I learned uh, so much about the world and about myself. Uh, I had a Latin teacher, Mr. Bresnicki, who's passed away, who taught me how to think. Um, and those are all skills that I've used through the rest of my life. Hi there. I'm an attorney at the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, and pro bono service is, of course, very important to our organization. And because it's Law Day, um, in addition to Windsor, can you name what your other favorite pro bono case from your career is, if you have one? Well, I've done a lot of pro bono cases. Uh, you know, I'd say the New York marriage case, but that wasn't a winner. Um, um, the truth is, you know, there's been some talk about this in the press. I mean, Paul Weiss did this case entirely pro bono. We didn't charge a penny. Um, we even paid for the fees for experts out of our pocket. I mean, it, that was just not an issue for us. Um, in fact, when I met Edie at her apartment that day, um, and she asked me, she looked at me. First, she wasn't sure whether I was qualified. Um, so she said, are you sure you can do this? And we went over, she had a computer in the corner, and I played the argument I did in New York, the loser case for her. Um, and she watched it a while and said, okay, I think you're good enough. And then she said, um, how much is this gonna cost me? And I remember putting, doing this with my hands. And she said, no, no, really, I wanna pay. And I said, no, no, really, you can't afford it. We're, we're gonna do this for <laughs> um, uh, But the truth of the matter is, I've been asked this many times, it never occurred to me that I would have to go back to the firm and ask for permission to do this case. Um, I went to Paul Weiss in part because doing cases like this are in our DNA. We were involved in Brown v. Board on a pro bono basis. Um, this is, we believe that lawyers who are as fortunate as we are have an obligation to give back. Um, and it really, I mean, I think I called the head of the firm a few days later and said I'm doing this case, but it was, it was a no-brainer for all of us. Um, and I. I think more people, I, I hope more lawyers do that. Certainly, we do it at Paul Weiss, and I, I think it's important to do that throughout the country and to help groups like Legal Aid Society. Uh, hi. Hi, everyone, Ms. Kaplan. Uh, my name is Hamza Saad. I'm from Westlake High School, and I'm a graduating senior. 
what's going on? <laughs> uh, I, just, I wanted to ask, since your morals helped you win that case because you believe so strongly and uh, you were so um, passionate about it, have you ever had your morals conflict with a case because you didn't believe in it? And did that make you struggle with the case or did you not even want to take part in that case? I've been very fortunate. As my wife, I talked to my wife before, my wife thinks that's impossible for me because I convince myself I'm right uh, in every case. I have never had that happen. Um, I frankly don't know what I would do um, if it happened, but I also believe that everyone has a right to a lawyer. Um, and there are criminal defense lawyers all the time who represent people who are at least accused of doing some pretty horrible things. And it's a noble thing to defend that person in court. So that's part of being a lawyer. Well, we're out of time, but I'd like to say on behalf of not only the legal community here in Cleveland, but all Clevelanders, Robbie, we're very, very proud of you, and we're delighted that you were here today. So thank you for that. Today at the City Club, we've been listening to a Friday forum with Robbie Kaplan, partner at Paul Weiss, lead counsel in the E.D. Windsor case. Thank you, Ms. Kaplan. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is now adjourned.